So listen, we've been in this series now called Balance. And it's a short series, but we've been talking about these reservoirs of our life, these kind of pockets of our faith that if, if, they, if they become out of balance, we really know what's happening. We really feel it. We really sense it. We, we, we go to sing our favorite worship song. It feels like there's this disconnection. We go to lean into some of our favorite passages of, passages of Scripture, and it still feels like there's that disconnection between us and God. And so I've been trying to resolve some of these things and trying to see what God is wanting to speak to us. And this morning, we get to lean into our last one that I've been looking forward to. But you see, something I love about Scripture, I love about the Word. And if you and I get to hang around long enough, we get to, uh, y- 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 you know me that I love, I absolutely love the deep fascination, love for the Word of God. I think what is so profound is that this book covers a long span of history of, of what God is doing in the world. And so we get to see how God surprises the world. I, uh, growing up as a kid, one of my grandparents, when we'd hang out, we'd you know, always go out and do errands. We'd always have projects at home that we'd do. And whenever I was with my, uh, this particular grandpa, he would never disclose what that day's agenda was. If my parents, you know, dropped us off on a Saturday morning or if he picked us up, there's always a lot of things happening, but he never told us what was going to happen. We never knew what was around the corner. And so moment by moment, he loved to surprise us, loved to surprise us. So we'd go out into, you know, we'd jump in the car and drive out into town. You know, we'd always be looking out the window, just peeking as kids like, okay, what street are we turning on? Right. Oh, we passed by McDonald's. Ah, no, right. We'd go all around town and, and some days we ended our favorite pizza parlor right in town, and we'd get a Hawaiian pizza. That was kind of a thing that we'd always do, and with, uh, with root beer floats also, too. But we love surprising us. I believe God is the exact same way. As he loves, loves over the scheme of time and over his grand plan of time. He loves to show us what he's been up to. Sometimes it's hard to wait for that. Amen, church? You see, there's this moment in the Old Testament that happens, and then it happens again in the New Testament, but a little bit different of a way. One of the most iconic stories in the Old Testament is the moment where God leads his people out of slavery in Egypt, the book of Exodus. We see the movies or the shows and the kids' stories about it or whatnot, but we know the story of Moses being used by God to, to kind of lead his people out of Egypt and as they're heading out, right, they, they come up to the, the edge of the Red Sea, right? And what's really fascinating about this story is that the Lord says to them, listen, we're not going to go the short way. We're actually going to go the long way. And he takes them to the Red Sea. The short way would have been faster. Maybe they would have gotten where they were going. There was other territories they were passing through, so there was dangers along the way. But really, there are always dangers wherever we're going in life. Some just look a little bit different than others. But God said, listen, we're going the long way around. And he brings them to the Red Sea, which then gives the Egyptians more time to catch up to them. But here they are at the edge of the Red Sea. And then God does this, this uh, watch this moment where he splits a road down the middle of the Red Sea, this massive body of water. And what happens is the Israelites then walk through. And imagine how terrifying that moment would be. Imagine you're just somebody in the crowd, one of the million people, right, who are on this journey with Moses. It wasn't Mo- Moses and a couple of people. It was a lot of folks. And imagine if you were at the back of the line because all the information was at the front of the line. Imagine if you were towards the end. You had no idea. You were just following, right, the person in front of you. And imagine you're walking through and you're seeing the walls of the sea separated. Imagine hearing then the 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 yelling and the roaring sound of the Egyptian army coming behind you. And you're terrified in this moment. And God says, listen, just follow, walk with me, walk with me. I never said this would be easy. I never said you weren't be afraid. But I said if you stuck with me, you'd get to the other side. And they make it to the other side, and then they're wondering what's going to happen next. And then all of a sudden, we see in the story as the waters fall down on the Egyptians. Then they're not done. There's still more to happen next in the story because what happens next is another moment. This one 
is not as fun. This one is a little harder to chew on because what happens next in the story is they get to the mountain, uh, the edge of the Mount Sinai, and what happens is God says, "Hey Moses, come come meet with me." Right, and he, he pulls them up, and he, you know Moses, you know most of the people stay kind of at the base of the mountain, and then Moses and many of the Levites and other leaders they travel a little bit up the mountain, and then Moses goes even further to meet with God, and we see something incredible happen. Right, where he discloses these commandments. Maybe you've heard of them. They get written on some tablets. Maybe you've heard that part of the story, right? But after Moses spends some time with God and he hears these things from him, he heads down a little bit to meet with the Levites and the other leaders too. And then a, a storm comes. And they're actually terrified at this moment because the clashing and the thundering of the storm, it is scaring them. And Moses just simply reminds, he's here with his other priestly leaders. He says, listen, don't, you know, this is to be reminded to be having a healthy dosage of fear of the Lord. And then they go back down the mountain. And this is where things start to get a little challenging and a little difficult. Because if you know the story, you know that Moses walks down. He hears everybody screaming and shouting and celebrating and and perhaps as he walks around the corner he sees all of these people worshiping a statue made of gold that they made and moses with his frustration and anger and, and worry all these emotions racing through his body he throws down these stone tablets given to him by god and he he runs people says what are you doing he destroys the golden statue he he then starts to yell at people, what on earth is going on? What are you doing? And people start to get their feelings hurt, right? right? What, what do you mean, what are we doing? We're not doing anything wrong. And Moses is like, Aaron, what did you, what? And Aaron's like, I just kind of happened. I had no idea if we put this gold together, it would become a statue, right? You're like, what, you, you doofus? What is going on right now? Are you serious? And, and then Moses pleads with God. Please, 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 please. And he looks at everyone around. He says, don't you remember the plagues in Egypt? Like the boils on the Egyptians? Don't you remember the, how the Nile was turned to blood? Don't, don't you remember? Don't you remember the Red Sea? Don't you remember the manna and water, the food given to us when we were wandering through the desert for a little bit to get here? Rem remember? So Moses begs that God would please have mercy on them. What happens is actually to help atone for what horrible thing they had done, how they had, they had spun their backs, they rejected and spit on the face of God. They actually decide, all right, get the Levites together, these priestly leaders, and they're going to put swords in their belts, and they're going to run through camp. And lots of people died that day, many of which ones who were angry and upset about their statue being destroyed, who were unintentionally, or maybe even intentionally, leading the people away from God. This is a terrifying moment. And Moses, on his hands and knees before the Lord, says, please don't walk away. Please don't walk away. You've got us this far. Please don't leave us here. And then God says, okay, we're going to keep moving forward. And Moses is like, listen, I get it. If, if, if you just kind of want to leave us on our own, we deserve this, I know. How about, how about, how about God, you bring someone to help me? Just bring someone to help me. And God says, okay, what we'll do is my, my presence will be with you. My presence will be with you, and I'll give you rest. And what happens next in the story is a monumental moment because there hasn't been another moment like it. At least at that time. You see, what happens next is the people go on this little bit of journey. They keep moving a little bit closer, a little bit closer. And there comes this moment where God says, all right, Moses, I want you to meet with me again. But this time it's going to be a little bit different. And Moses says, Lord, I just need to see you. He says, show me your glory. I just need to see you. And at the end of Exodus 33, 
God begins to give a little bit of instructions to Moses. He says this, he says, when my glory passes by, he says, I want you to come up onto this rock. I want you to come up to this mountain. He says, when the, my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock, this kind of cut out in the rock, and cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. And this is a unique moment. As Moses is meeting with God in a way that no one else had. Not even Abraham. And this is, end of verse, uh, chapter 34, says, The Lord said to Moses, Choose out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that, you, uh, that were on the first tablets which you broke. I love that moment as God is reminding him of Remember, remember what you did? Remember the, the broken part, right? <laughs> Verse 2, it says, Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. And so God is giving him all these instructions of what to do to come meet with him in a way, again, that no one ever had. And when the moment actually happens and Moses gets to see the glory, gets to see the presence of God, in such a tangible, real way. It says in verse 6, it said, And he passed in front of Moses, and God was speaking this. It says God was proclaiming this about himself to Moses. As he says that the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. And he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. This is a moment where humanity sees God in a way in the Old Testament they never imagined they'd be able to. And what is profound in this moment is that not only does Moses get to meet God in this way, but it's such a real life-changing moment as Moses hears from God, hears from his very voice as he speaks about himself to Moses, telling him, oh my goodness, I'm gracious. I'm abounding in love and faithfulness. I'm slow to anger. This is who I am. He says, yet, I don't like sin. I don't ignore it. I don't also leave it undealt with. And right here in this moment, God is very plainly revealing to Moses this profound reality of how on earth the goodness of God can meet with the brokenness of the world. How on earth can, can such a loving creator spend time with and be close with his creation that became broken because they, they wanted nothing to do with him. How can this relationship take place? And God explains that there's this balance between my tremendous love for you, but also the reality of your brokenness and your sin. And I said a minute ago how this moment is the beginning of the connecting of dots that will be filled later. And what's amazing in this story is that as God is speaking to himself, he says some incredible words. He says something that actually to the Old Testament people, to the Israelites, it becomes a saying, this, this phrase of their way of life, their culture, that they remember about God. And he, they, they lean back to the statement of abounding in love and faithfulness. I love how, how the New King James Version writes it. It says, abounding in goodness and truth, that this is God. And what's astonishing is that in this moment of one small man seeing the glory of God in a way that no one else had for a really, really long time, it's only yet the beginning. Because there'd be another moment where God would meet with the world in a way that would blow their minds. 
Because when Jesus comes into the world, one of the very things, first things said about him is this reality in 1 John 14. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory. Talk about Moses. We've seen his glory. But now we get to see the son. Like we, we, we've seen this and we were amazed and taken back and couldn't even believe it. But now we get to see the son. And he's pitched his tent to live with us. And it says that, uh, that we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth is actually the, uh, the Greek equivalent to the abounding in love and faithfulness as said in the Old Testament. So when humanity meets Jesus, they use the same way to describe his coming into the world that God used to describe himself in the Old Testament. And what it begins to explain to us is this tremendous and important balance of grace and truth in our life as we're walking with God. Because as God is approaching us, as God is calling us close to him, and we're wanting to seek him and to know him and be with him, it's this, it's this balance of grace and truth. These two words that we're familiar with in our Christian circles, we talk about them in church, we I, these are not foreign to us, right? These aren't hard to pronounce. They're not hard to define. We, we know them, but the reality is, is that so much of the time when we experience this disconnect between us and God, when it seems like our faith is not like what it used to be, the reality is, is that we had let our hearts slip when it came to grabbing a hold of God's grace and grabbing a hold of God's truth. Because much of the time, either side becomes so out of whack. A lot of the time, we, 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 we sometimes lean heavier into truth if we've been walking with God for a while. If we've been journeying with God for some most of our life, we, we, we build up this confidence of what we know. We build up this sense of, 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 of kind of knowledge of, of being familiar with who God is and what his word says about life. And perhaps we are great at following it. Perhaps we kind of have these moments that we struggle. But what happens when we lean heavier into truth, we develop this heart and this mentality within us that has this deep, deep, debilitating fear of God. Now we should fear the Lord. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But the reality is, is that we come into this place, but what happens is we find ourselves doing our best to make it up to him. What is most obvious is we let our hearts become bitter when we see other people doing the thing that we know they shouldn't be doing. The reality is it's easy to lean into truth and say, you know what? I've, I've done all the right things. I've got 30 years of obedience behind me. I'm okay now. I'm good. We also find it easy for the seesaw to teeter the other way. Because we find it so easy to fall into a way of living that leans so heavy into grace that we forget. We forget what God has done and made possible for us. We actually get so lost in our focus on grace, we forget the high price that was it made possible to us. And so honestly, we become a little ungrateful. We do things we know God doesn't want us to do, but in the back of our mind, we'll just say, oh, he'll forgive me. So it's okay. We forget that Jesus himself said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you'll follow my command. If you love me, 
You'll live by my truth. And the reality is, friends, is that even when these begin to become out of balance, our perception and our grasp of both grace and truth becomes so distorted. And what happens is that we begin to completely let go of what really both of these things are. Because what happens is we become people, if we've been entrenched in truth, what, I'm sorry, when we become entrenched with grace and we forget about the truth part, what happens is that we actually begin to mock the truth of what God says about humanity. When he says that we need salvation, when we need to be redeemed, we mock his truth. We ask questions of, of, of such like, why does God allow bad things happen to good people? And that position, that, that question begins with the position of arrogance of self, thinking that we're always great, wonderful people. We have adopted a way of life that says as long as 51% of us, as long as a little bit of a majority of our life is good, then therefore we are good. And God says, no, 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 that's not how it works. I made life. I know how this thing works. He says this, but a fraction of a percentage that then ruins all and if we can be honest with ourselves our selfishness tends to get in the way of our call from God to love and forgive people our selfishness gets in the way of honoring God we can be frank You see, what happens is when we lean so hard into truth and our distortion of everything goes out the window, what happens is we become so entrenched and we, we mock the grace of God for ourselves. Because what happens is we let the words of Jesus talk about a plank of wood and a, a splinter. Maybe you know the story. We let that slip out of our mind. And so what happens is we look around the room, we look at other people, and our hearts become very bitter. We become like the prophet Jonah that wanted nothing to do with the people of Nineveh because he was angry and bitter, and he didn't even want God to help him. Compassion left. And what happens is we completely forget that it is God's grace that brought us to where we are today. We forgot that it was the very grace of God that that God has given us, that has brought us to where we are today, and it is the same grace of God that, that he wants to bring into those around us that we're so busy judging. And so we come into this position or conversation where we wonder, how do we gain some balance back? How do we fix this? And I thought you never would ask. <laughs> Because it is all so simple. Yet so hard. And if we could be real for a moment, that is much of our journey of faith, is it? Oh, it's so simple. But is it all so hard? James, one of my favorite books in the New Testament, begins to speak to the church about how, should they, how they should be to other people and how they should be to the world. The book of James is one of my favorite books in the New Testament because he gets right to the point. He doesn't, he doesn't go through all the other stuff. He just says, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, don't do this. I tell you right now, if you're looking for a book of the Bible to read or something to study, read the book of James. It's five chapters long, and it is great. It is great. And as he nears the end, towards the end of, or towards the beginning and middle of chapter four, what happens is he begins to change the conversation because he begins to explain to the world and to the church how this doing and being is possible. He says this in James chapter four, verses six through 10. It says, that is why scripture says, God opposes the proud which shows favor to the humble. He's quoting Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 in this moment. That is why Scripture says God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 
Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Some would say that James is a little bit of a glass half empty kind of guy, and perhaps that's a good way to describe him. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift you up. For us to embrace this balance of grace and truth, we've got to begin to fall into a place of humbling ourselves before God. I said it would be easy. I didn't say it would be easy to do. Come into a place of recognizing that it is our pride that gets in the way of us experiencing the full abundance of God's grace for us. Our pride looks to God and says, I'm good. I'm good and and I don't need your grace. Our pride looks to God and says, I'm doing all right. I'm figuring this out on my own. Lord, I'm strong enough. I'm tough enough. I'm smart enough. I've, I've, I've been walking these streets for many years. I know what to do. Our pride gets in the way when our humility should really take its place. Where regardless of what season of life we're in, regardless of what uh, uh, what what kind of season of faith we're in, whether we're new to walking with God or perhaps it's been a, a number of years, we forget. We forget that we should be like Moses who begged and pleaded to God for to not walk away, to recognize that to have a humble heart, we've got to be hungry for the grace of God in our life. I'm saying, Lord, the only reason I made it to this spot, the only reason I have the wife and kids that I have, the life that I have, the only reason I have the stability and the peace, the only reason I've made it to this place is because of your favor, because of your grace. The only reason I know the truth that you've shared with me is because you've had the grace to chase after me. The only reason I can I can walk in truth and find confidence in knowing the path I'm following is right. The only way I, I embrace that, the only reason I know truth is because you took the time to say, let's do this again. Okay, let, let's talk about this again. How about how about we, we come back again? I, I I you got it wrong. It's okay. Come back again. We need truth, and we need grace. Both are essential in our journey of faith. And when they go out of whack, that that is when we start to notice the symptoms of a heart that is out of balance with God. That is when we begin to recognize that our prayers don't seem like they used to. And our moments of being in the body aren't like they were. We would come into this place, and it's like we were brothers and sisters. We'd come into Bible studies and groups, and we would share testimonies. We'd pray with each other, and there used to be this fire. But now it feels like I'm the one that's missing out. Perhaps we need to begin by remembering how essential it is that our heart is humble before God. God says a lot in his word of all he is against. And a lot of things are the external of life. But in this moment, he makes it very clear that he opposes pride. He opposes your, your, your focus on, on making sure that no one sees the weak links in your armor and making sure that you can earn it up to God. He opposes that. Oh my goodness. The creator of the universe, the one who made all of this, opposes you when there's pride 
something deep into your heart that's steering the wheel of everything. Oh my goodness. Perhaps if we'd allow God to give us some grace, because we know we need it, we could really have received that truth. Amen. Friends, I want us in this moment to lean into prayer. And I don't want to do this just because that's what Pastor Andre does when he ends the sermon. All right, now we sing this next song. I want us to go into a moment of seeking the face of God and really saying, Lord, my heart is yours. I'm sorry if I got a little stubborn and I put my hand on the steering wheel. I know I'm sitting in the passenger seat, but sometimes I get nervous and I reach across and, ah! Lord, I'm willing to take the long way around if it means it's better. That's how you led the people in the Old Testament. I'm willing to let this thing be an oven thing and not a microwave thing, and I'm okay with that. I'm willing to let this thing make me feel uncomfortable. Even if it means if I got to walk through the Red Sea and feel the terror shaking me in the bones. You never said that I'd be safe and comfy and be warm and tucked in every single night. But you said that, Lord, if I stuck with you, I'd make it to the other side. And that's what I'm going to do. We have a heart that just falls before the Lord. And so, Lord, I, I remember your place. I remember my place. I remember that you are abounding in love. But you, you hate the evil that sometimes I cling to. Lord, you are quick to forgive. But that requires me to ask and be humble enough to Ask for forgiveness. Would you pray with me?